All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back to what I hope will be a relatively uh, short guide video testing out a new topic. Um, I've been waiting to get onto another general topic for a while now, and as I'm finally starting to get a little bit of time, I thought I'd at least make a start on this. And the topic I wanted to cover was uh, remote attack spells in Dominions. Um, and specifically, one of the four classes of remote attack spells. Because when you're talking about remote attacks, on the top level you're talking about any spell that a mage casts as a ritual that targets an opposing province or army. But they really come into a couple of categories. There are remote assassination spells, which are spells which target enemy commanders uh, and try and kill them. Some of these through straight damage, like say Seeking Arrow, some through literally sending assassins at them. Uh, like for example, Atlantis Unique Spells uh, sent Tupelac or Infernal Disease from Blood. Then there are remote attack spells which cause attacks in opposing provinces and are a way of trying to take over or at least send neutral enemy provinces. Um, Call of the Winds can do this. The Send Horror spells do this uh, quite effectively. Um, and the goal of those is to do things like cut retreat paths and do economic damage uh, on the short term by changing the ownership of a province. The third remote attack spell class are ones that actually ruin provinces themselves. Things like uh, tidal waves, things like um, black deaths, things like volcanic eruptions. Things that kill population are usually the best province destroyers, but there are also things like unrest generators. And then there are the spells that I want to talk about uh, today. And I'm not sure whether I'll bind this together with other parts of the video or whether I'll keep this separate. But it's the relatively small collection, and this is not an exhaustive list, but this is a, a sample of ones that I think are most significant, of army killing spells. That is, um, spells that are cast at enemy armies with the intention of killing both troops and commanders. Um, these are the ballistic weapons of the Dominion's universe. They are capable of striking enemies over hundreds of, oh, hundreds of kilometers distance, several provinces away, and doing damage to enemy armies in the field rather than to cities, for example. Um, they are, in my view, a key to part of the Dominion's meta because they help explain why the late game can become a little bit cat and mouse. Um, because normally what happens is, as magic starts to come online, you get encouraged to, and this happens at the troop level too, you're encouraged to ball your armies more and more and more, because having you know, more troops and more mages means you defeat another force of mages and troops uh, with proportionally fewer casualties, because you've got more firepower and killing power and magic power on the field. Um, you start to want to bring things together like major communions. Those communions then launch the counters to the sort of magics that would otherwise, you know, battlefield wipe you. If people start deploying certain battlefield wipes, usually you can get the counters in the forms of your own mages. But if you ball too hard, one of two things can happen. One is that the opponent can drop a dedicated stack wiper on you, so a specially built super combatant or something, a suicide caster with a stack wipe spell that you can't counter fully, for example, or you can make yourself open to remote attack spells. And what you'll see is, especially amongst the spells that I rate better, these remote attack spells aren't limited in the number of targets they can hit and instead hit proportions of the opposing army. As a result, they discourage uh, people from bundling their forces together as much and allows you to punish them when they do. This is particularly important if you are defending uh, sieges. If you have lots and lots of siege defense and you can remote attack the force that is on top of your fort, then you can you know, reduce its ability to break down. This makes uh, defending a lot easier um, and attacking a lot harder, all things considered. The other thing I'll note in terms of like the attack defense dichotomy of these spells before we start talking about them and how we use them is the fact that they are more powerful on defense than attack because the defender usually has the privilege of sitting on a lab and casting a dome if they're worried about getting remote attacked in a big way. Whereas on the attack, unless you're standing on a lab, which you can't do if you're, for example, sieging a fort, you can't cast the ritual spells you need to ward a province and defend yourself from these spells with any degree of um, any degree of reliability. So let's talk about the spells and then a little bit about how we use them and how we how they shape the gameplay. Um, as usual, I've sort of got a slight left to right ordering going on. It's not precise from 
uh, it's kind of crap to these spells are can be potentially game defining in in this class of spells and it'll let us look and it'll allow us to highlight which schools and which fields of magic offer the best in this sort of area um, the earliest remote attack spell you can get is something called fires from afar um, fires from afar is almost never worth it because fires from afar uh, hits a capped number of units in the opposing province um, I've heard various numbers bandied around at various times, um, but it hits a small number. Uh, I believe this 15 is the cap, up to 15 enemy units with uh, armor-piercing fire damage, which is usually enough to kill a human, but is not usually enough to kill, for example, a giant or a demigiant. Um, and super heavily armored humans may survive. Now, why is this not really worth it? Well, at 10 fire gems, even if you kill 15 targets, if you kill 15 troops, it's not going to be bloody worth it. In order to make this spell worth it, you'd have to reliably kill mages. And the problem is, when you're only hitting 15 troops, an army of 150 people, if 95% of that army are troops, for example, your likelihood of hitting a mage is actually pretty short. Pretty long, rather. Um, you're not you're not going to do it reliably. It's also relatively short ranged at three provinces, but that's not necessarily a problem. Um, these fire gems can usually be better spent against most targets by throwing ten full sized fire elementals at them, because you've got three fire paths in order to cast it in the first instance. If you converted this into ten large fire elementals, you might smack that army of 150 people in its entirety, rather than just tickling a couple of them. Um, at relatively close range and not reliably hitting major targets. Uh, against certain factions, this spell is outright useless. Um, and against those where it would reliably kill units, you're not going to get value out of it. So I tend to reject fires from afar. It's notable only because you get it so bloody early. There might be a niche case use for this that you might think of. Maybe if the only things that the enemy is sending in is like a ball of mages for whatever reasons. Maybe you see a, a party of you know, 15 communion mages coming up behind the army to reinforce it, and you go, you know what, I'm going to take a shot, see what I can hit and kill, uh, and you might get some mages. But under ordinary circumstances, I reject fire from afar. Leprosy and Baleful Star are interesting in that neither of them are, are actually killing spells, uh, and they're both relatively cheap, quite long range, um, and they serve to weaken rather than kill units in an opposing army. Thaumaturgy 6, Death 5 for Leprosy, Alteration 5, Astral 3 for Baleful Star, so very accessible. Um, leprosy does exactly what it says on the tin. So 50% of units in the target province must make an MR check or get diseased. Disease kills units in 10 turns time. They lose 10% of their max HP every turn. So it does weaken them in battle if you fight them in 5 or 6 turns from then. Uh, it gives them afflictions in the meantime. Uh, but they can pass it with an MR check. So, it really depends on your target. The, certainly the larger an army it is, the more likely this 10 death gems is to be worth it. Um, certainly, potentially has some use as a um, deterrent under certain circumstances. The one time I've seen this used quite effectively is against large blobs of middle-aged, or I suppose early age would do it too, uh, almish, almish death blobs. So, blobs of... MR7 humans uh, who will fail that magic resistance check, who come in very large numbers but who are slow to replace because they're resource requirements. And what you can do in that case is you can throw leprosy maybe two turns in a row. Uh, you'll actually get a majority of the army diseased in those circumstances. And then if you can drag out a war, or if you do fight them later, more of them will have afflictions and more of them will have um, lesser HP. But the duration, the, the time to kill is very long. Um, the enemy usually won't be able to counter with disease healers in the sort of numbers that you're looking at because, well, you're only hitting big stacks with this thing. So they need a lot of disease healers pleasant, present. Um, it can endanger commanders and put a time limit on commanders. Um, so I would rate leprosy as, you know, okay. Um, I think it probably has a case, it could potentially even have a case to be up here. I just think that time to kill being so long means it belongs in this little discussion category here with Baleful Star. Also, death gems are valuable, right? Like, 10 death gems is not nothing, 
But if you were to say, I want to know whether I want, you know, the long dead horseman this would get from Pale Riders or whether I want to disease, you know, 30% of the enemy army, sometimes that 30% of the enemy army is going to be worth more than those long dead horsemen to you. Uh, certainly will annoy people, and I think it's got great diplomatic potential too. Because, and this is worth calling out. And if there's a reason I escalated up here, it would be this. Leprosy may not be enough to stop an opponent killing you in a war but it guarantees close to 100% casualties before he fights his next war. If you're spamming leprosy on his major stacks, only two or three turns of cast is enough to sort of put a death knell over most low and middle MR stacks. And that means that your opponent, while they'll beat you, won't be in a position to win their next war as easily. And to that extent, I consider it a valuable deterrent. That said, if you are someone who's playing against me in the game, uh, ignore this video, do not cast this spell against me. It's useless, it has a long time to kill, you would never want to use it against me. Ever. If the opposing player is Perun, uh, Leprosy doesn't exist. Let's, let's put it over here. Uh, Baleful Star. Baleful Star operates in a similar sort of vein. It doesn't put a time limit on their life, it puts an uh, immediate cap on their efficacy. So, it hits uh, provinces with an anonymous event, so this is anonymous. Um, people won't know you've cast it, which gives it life in and of itself. And with the seven province range, it's harder to narrow down who cast it. Um, and anyone exposed to the star risks getting cursed for the rest of their life. So curse is a pretty crappy condition in some ways. It basically buggers up all your rolls, makes you more likely to be crit. Um, it's, it's not a good condition, but it doesn't kill anything. And if it hits things like mages, those mages can just stay out of the line of fire. If it hits troops, then, you know, sometimes troops die anyway. It's cheap, it's long range, it's anonymous, but it just doesn't have the hitting power of what make these heavier spells heavy, in that it doesn't actually remove troops from the game then. And in so doing, it means that an opponent isn't going to feel that pain immediately, even if they can intellectually process that their army is being made less effective. Um, the, the number of units cursed is usually not going to be high enough, and the effect of curse is not obvious and immediate enough to be a genuine deterrent. But I think it's got, I think it's got some utility. Having talked about those spells, you then start talking about spells which actually inflict decent numbers of immediate casualties. And they come in two categories here. Both come at Thaumaturgy 6, which is interesting. You'll notice that so far, in this tier, Thaumaturgy is actually the king of remote attack spells. So I'm just going to have a sip of water, and then we're going to talk about Melancholia, and we're going to talk about Beckoning and their respective benefits. All right, we're back. We're back um, because I had recorded the second half of this video and then it did not, in fact, save. So good on it. But um, that does mean I can make a quick co uh, correction. I went and checked what uh, Curse did because I remember I felt a little odd explaining Curse because I was going from memory. Um, curse is, is not what I was describing where it stuffs up all their roles. Curse is the condition which um, causes individuals to take afflictions far more often when they take damage. Now, that means Curse is usually used on thugs, super combatants, etc. Which is at odds with its role as a spell which here would mostly hit armies. But you can still use this to inflict um, curses on raiding super combatants or thugs. But as an army killer, look, troops at a front line will usually die or not die in most cases as opposed to racking up a bunch of afflictions and usually people don't track that too closely anyway. So I keep that in mind when you uh, regard Baleful Star as an option. Let's move on to some actual killie spells. Let's get to the point where we're actually going to uh, chunk down armies a little bit. And I'm going to talk about two uh, average, I'd say average spells that usually most people wouldn't cast, but there might be niche cases, and then two spells which are game-defining uh, under certain circumstances. Well, one game-defining always, and one under certain circumstances arguably being even better, um, Murdering Winter, which I get very excited about. So let's come back to that in just a minute. Beckoning. So Beckoning and Melancholia, both at Thaumaturgy 6. So Thaumaturgy is our, is our path of choice here, but you get to pick between Nature and Earth. These are both make some of the army disappear sort of spells. Um, so let's have a look at Beckoning first. You awaken the force of the wild, they lure people, um, 
So up to 50 plus five per additional caster level. So if you go up to nature 10, you could hypothetically get uh, 75 units affected. Must succeed a difficult MR check or a difficult morale check or wander off into the wildernesses. Units with forest survival ignore this spell. So here you've got a cap on how many units you will kill. 50 or 60 maybe if you're using like a god or something to cast this will usually be the maximum number of people affected. And if they have high levels of magic resistance or high levels of morale, they're likely to resist. Well, it's possible that they will resist. Um, difficult checks are obviously more difficult than straight V10 checks. I think it's plus four, I think, for difficult. So testing V14. But if something's got morale 14, it's going to pass half the time anyway, which means um, your 50 will be cut down to 25 pretty quickly at which point you're paying almost a gem per unit that you wipe out. So the trade-off here is that this is, in terms of getting large numbers of kills, most effective against stacks of units with low morale, low magic resistance. But because it doesn't do damage, it just makes the unit disappear into the wild and never come back. It's most effective at killing, well, you'd mostly want to use it to kill units that are extremely tanky and have high levels of HP except for the fact those units tend to, not always, but tend to have high levels of MR and or morale um, to begin with. So the perfect target for beckoning seldom exists. Uh, it would be a very large stack of low morale, low MR, extremely high protection, extremely high HP, gold intensive units. Um, I'm happy to see in the comments what people's use case for beckoning is. For my mind, you'd usually have better chance to, to destroy whatever army they happen to be in um, by taking those 20 nature gems and sticking them on a bunch of casters and doing like Creeping Doom, Howl, Mass Re... Like, using them for battlefield magic as opposed to remote attacking them because I think spending a gem per unit killed is usually not worth it. Um, but like I said, there may be there may be niche cases. Melancholia doesn't have the um, cap. Melancholia says all units in a province must check MR V10 and morale check V10. If they fail both, they desert. 20 Earth Gems, remote, single province, range 5. So a little bit of a longer range. Also sets it to Sloth 3. Uh, Sloth 3 makes it vaguely trolly if you're targeting like Let's just say all is stacking 600 units on their capital for whatever reason before they move out into a war. You can get the combination of both the um, the desertion check and you can ruin their productivity on the province. But 20 Earth Gems is a pretty hefty price to pay to sloth three a province, especially when uh, I've decided I will do a follow-up video relatively soon on province destroying spells. You can destroy provinces a lot better than just sending them to sloth three for 20 for 20 Earth Gems. Like there are better options out there. Um, unrest is a better option, and we can talk about that in that later video. But let's talk about the unit killing potential. All units may make MR V10 and Morale V10 if they fail both they desert. So this is an even more extreme case than the above, where um, the checks are no longer difficult. The checks are no longer difficult, so they're V10, so uh, elite units are very, very likely to pass these, but you don't have your 50 unit max. So, if a stack is sufficiently large, it's hypothetically possible for this to become worthwhile. Unfortunately, really, 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 really big stacks of units in Dominions tend to be things like undead that cannot fail morale checks. Um, so you'll never get deserting undead. So this is not going to slaughter the huge stacks of undead that are... Solaria or Ermor or Lemuria are going to bring to the fight. Um, is anyone else going to bring giant, giant stacks to the fight? Well, hypothetically, like let's just say Fleg Middle Age Flegra has like a thousand helots in a province supported by like mouflons and supply items. Um, they have shitty MR and morale. Yes, they're very easily replaceable, but um, wiping out a large track of that army might still be, you know, great if they're defended by. Battlefield magic, which makes it hard for you to kill them with, say, firestorms or anything like that. And this is only Thalm 6. There, are, I see more niche cases for Melancholia than I do for Beckoning. Uh, Beckoning, 
it's less likely that I will encounter a moderate sized stack of elites that nonetheless, despite being elites, have crappy MR and morale than I will a god awful huge stack of shit, uh, which is where melancholia will shine. It'll make large, large, large numbers of units disappear unexpectedly. Uh, and you can use it underwater, which is kind of handy. Uh, that and beckoning, it applies to both. So I can see niche cases for melancholia. In general, I would say you're not going Thalm 6 to get beckoning and melancholia, but they're interesting tools to accept that you have in your toolbox for niche use cases. Important to be aware that they exist, but I don't think they're particularly important to this discussion of how remote attacks can be meta-shaping. These two spells can be meta-shaping. Flames from the Skies and Murdering Winter are superb spells that, that rest in evocation, which is not normally a school you'd buy up to very high levels. But if you're going into it for high levels, um, it can pay off in a big way. The difference between Evo 7 and Evo 9, however, is huge. Remember that the opportunity cost for going up to Flames from the Sky at Evo 9 could have gotten you to, say, Wish or Arcane Nexus, or Master and Slave. So it has to be good to compete in that sort of opportunity cost zone. But Murdering Winter at Evocation 7 is decidedly more affordable. So let's discuss them in terms. I'm going to rearrange them like this, but this is not judgment. This is, for the moment, just physically separating them so we think about one at the time, because they are, in some ways, very different, but we'll talk about how they shape the game in a similar ways. Murdering Winter. 40 water gems, range 4 provinces. It affects half the pro half of the all units in a province. It cannot target the same province more than one per turn, so you cannot load up more than one Murdering Winter on a province. The amount of damage to commanders that are hit by this, because half of commanders will be hit as well, is 75% of the damage amount. It cannot target underwater. The, de the base damage is 8, but stick with me for a moment. It's armor negating. It's chill cold, it ignores shields, um, oh, and may use underwater, sorry. It's uh, flames from the sky that you can't use underwater. Um, so you can use it underwater. What are the important factors to look at here? The first is armor negating. Because it is armor negating, uh, high prot stacks, which is a, a hallmark of a lot of elite units, and is the way I would say a lot of human units decide to stay alive in the Dominions universe, does not apply to Murdering Winter. Murdering Winter is a bane of human HP, human sized units, and in neutral temperature scales, 8 AN damage via 10 HP human will kill, you know maybe 15 to 20 percent of units in the province. I've made that number up, but you got to, it's basically, you'll hit half of them, and then you have to beat the 8v10 roll um, with a DRN on each in order for the spell to actually kill them. However, cold scales add to the damage. Um, and let me just, the, the number of damage it adds per cold scale has changed over time. I think in Dominions 3, it was 2 per cold scale, and it's doing 7 AN base. I'm not sure if it's currently uh, 1 or 2 per cold base, but if you think about it, that means in cold 3, you're adjusting this up to um, more than human HP base AN. And you will consistently kill, um, in your best cases, about 30 to 40% of human HP units in a cold 3 province you target with this. The results can be incredible. Um, you can add, so the caster throwing this can have ritual range extending spells in order to reach this out to range five, sit behind your lines. And because you can force cold three scales with um, uh, Wolven Winter, this spell can either be very effective defensively if you have cold three, or if, you're, or if you're imposing Cold 3 with Wolf and Winter, Murder and Winter can become an incredibly powerful offensive spell. Um, I have used this to... This is the reason that I stockpiled Water Gems in my Late Age Atlantis game, which I will get final videos up for, um, I'm hoping, relatively soon. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a hard week. Um, 
but hopefully I'll be able to record something for that soon to close out that game. Uh, I know GC's already posted his video where he's judged the end of that game. But I saved up huge numbers of gems for Murdering Winter, and the results were just incredible on human HP foes. In particular, this and Flames in the Sky both annihilate communions very effectively because they randomly wipe out significant shares of the low HP communion mages in those provinces. Um, at boosted damage, you'll still kill a significant number of commanders even with this 75% uh, application in place. So, Murdering Winter is extremely effective. It can be quite cost effective. If you're killing, say, if you kill five commanders and 300 troops, it's hard to argue that, you know, the 40 gems wasn't worth it. Even if you only kill 120 units, of which, say, five or six are commanders, there are situations where they can absolutely turn a war. Um, more than, for example, say, summoning 20 water, water elementals might on the field of battle if the appropriate magic is in play, especially because there's no way to hide from it. Uh, it's very trollish targeting research parks uh, parks with this. Um, it can be it can be brutal. Uh, Flames from the sky has a little more utility in some ways, and then it's not dependent on cold three. Flames from the sky is a short range spell, only three provinces, but you'll almost always be able to give your guy a flame stick in order to make it ritual range four. And what I do is I just boost someone up to fire five, give them the fire stick. Um, rename them something like IRBM, uh, stick them in a fort, and those things become power projection silos, firing off flames from the sky at any target of opportunity nearby. Flames from the sky and Murdering Winter, by the way, are both anonymous spells. So, uh, yes, your target will usually be able to work it out, but you can throw these spells and I think get away with it most of the time. I know, let me just, I'll quickly check that. I know at least Murdering Winter is anonymous. Um, they're both anonymous, so that's that's trollish. Anyway, so similarly, you're going to affect half of an army in a province, so you'll hit 50% of the targets. In this case, it's because only half of the gathered at any given time. You can't go under C. Um, it's armor piercing, it ignores shields, and it's 15 base damage. Uh, plus one for every level of fire you have above five. So you can push that with, say, a fire seven god. You'll get a little bit extra damage out of there, for example. It, it can be a little handy. Uh, armor piercing obviously changes the type of target that we're looking for here. Whereas armor negating murdering winter says I want to find a giant stack of Ormish smiths and troops and freeze them all to death. Flames from the sky says remember that um, unit of 3000 undead death stack that Solaria was running around with? I want to target that. For 30 fire gems you'll inflict 15 uh, plus armor piercing fire damage which ignores shields on half of the units and commanders in a province and there's no um, there's no natural damage reduction for commanders so what this does is it slaughters chaff in ungodly quantities it, it says pick pick army remove half chaff for 30 fire gems it also pokes those commanders really badly and if they're human health commanders a, a fascinating trait of so many mages in Dominion, so many mages, of all races, elves, humans, all of them, is that most of them don't wear particularly heavy armor. Think about elvish mages, think about human mages. Um, even when we're starting to look at, say, uh, Atlantean mages, who have higher HP to be sure, so you won't kill most of them because you'll be throwing 15 armor piercing versus, you know, usually about 20 HP. Uh, but you'll kill some of them. But really, this is this thing slaughters human HP mages um, and elvish mages in ungodly quantities as well. And for 30 fire gems, it is an absolute steal. Once you have either Murdering Winter or Flames from the Sky, more Flames from the Sky than Murdering Winter, because Murdering Winter only applies at its best defensively, and in heat provinces, the damage scale goes the other way to the point where it becomes virtually harmless. So Murdering Winter gives you power defensively and potentially offensively to delete significant shares of stacks. Flames from the Sky guarantees you that ability anywhere. Anywhere that doesn't have a dome up. And even if it has a dome up, um, there's still a chance that a spell will go through a dome. Which is great. Um, this 
spell, and to an extent both these spell, force a few things. It means that if your opponent relies on gigantic stacks of chaff in order to crack your walls, they are always going to be vulnerable to these spells. If you were able to stack, um, my classic example was if you are Nazca and you stick a whole bunch of Hatun Runa in a fort, so the other guy needs to bring like a thousand, two thousand undead or something, or you know, huge numbers of troops with supply items, or lots and lots of commanders with gate cleavers, noting that gate cleavers are expensive, um, and sit them on your fort for a couple of turns in order to crack it open. You can hit that sieging force with these spells and brutalize them. Um, it makes it hard to maintain sieges, it makes it hard to crack forts, and there's no way to defend yourself when you're sieging because you can't cast a dome without access to the lab, which is inside the castle walls. It also means research parks are not as safe as they used to be and probably need to be domed after the first time this happens. Um, it's not unusual for uh, nations to have very, very large research parks in their capital, um, especially if they've withdrawn other... If you're winning a war, as they've withdrawn other ones. Um, it also makes communions, which are otherwise the king... I think communions are otherwise the kings of battlefield magic. Uh, things like the Flegrin community in particular, because they're on instantly, turn one, um, are exceptionally powerful because they're able to protect themselves from what would otherwise be battlefield wipes. A properly configured uh, Pythian or Flegrin communion in the Pythian case, they need to use crystals for the masters, but the communi the communicants are naturally snapped into the communion. Uh, they can get a bunch of turn one protection buffs off, which make them very hard to kill, or much harder to kill than they have any right to be, and then they can effortlessly throw out really high levels of battlefield support magic that make beating them, even with things like super combatants, quite difficult, because those sort of communions have a lot of ways to make life for single targets very, very difficult. They can summon a bunch of chaff and then throw a bunch of save or die spells at them until they die, for example. Um, if you add some blood, you know, there's all the blood super combatant slayers. Communions are dangerous, especially communions that are on instantly and can defend themselves from battlefield wipes. Flames from the sky and murdering winter do not care. If it is a human hate if there is a human HP element to your communion, it is vulnerable. And because communions are very vulnerable to being lopsided, so if you kill a lot of the slaves but the masters are still there, the communion can then uh, implode in spectacular fashion. So if you kill, for example, a whole bunch of the Theo communicants, but most of the Theogs themselves are likely to survive, well, the Theogs are just going to kill the remaining communicants in record time, snap themselves out of the communion, and all of a sudden you're good to go. Or, even better, if the enemy has their communion set up, so one caster is going to throw Army of Lead, one is going to throw Will of the Fates, one's putting up Mass Regen, you know, the whole the whole shebang. You've seen this with some of my games, with my late game communions, putting up every battlefield enchant under the sun. Um, if the one guy casting something critical is killed before the battle phase, because remember, these are remote attack spells, they hit in the magic phase, you can kill the one guy casting a particular important buff and ruin the entire plan, which means all of a sudden you need multiple people scripted to cast the same spell, which means wasted gems, wasted casters, and fewer things actually put out that help. Or you encounter an army that was meant to hit you with, say, army of lead, no, sorry, army of gold before it activated Firestorm, but oh no, you killed the army of gold caster, but Firestorm still goes up and it immolates itself. There is so much fun that can be accomplished with Flames from the Sky and Murdering Winter in this way that goes even beyond what remote attack spells, uh, so remote assassination spells can accomplish against big communions. Remote assassination spells are usually at their best, either in very large numbers in those circumstances or against like single, more thuggy sort of targets um, that are still nonetheless vulnerable to the assassination spells. So I think Flames from the Sky is meta-shaping. There are a few communions it can't deal with. Even things like if you consider uh, a, a late-game sort of um, Utgard or Gathian turbo communion where the slaves are scrawdy, but the car, the the primary, sorry, the uh, the late age late age giant nation where they're using Seath Kona, uh, Seath Kona, and hu they're using human HP masters and um, scrawdy slaves. 
this will still kill the masters, for example, even though it won't kill the slaves, which is really handy. Um, I, I really like this spell. Uh, I have used it to great effect in two games, one of which was the Nazca game. Could I have won the Nazca game without Flames in the Sky? Absolutely. However, in about three turns, it killed 4,000 enemy units, most of which were long dead, but it also killed a significant number of communion mages from Tian Shi. Uh, it killed the god of Tian Shi, which was a demi lich, which otherwise was a significant threat. Um, yes, it was going to respawn, but it wasn't going to be around during my throne rush. All for the price of 30 fire gems. And also you kill a bunch of researchers. So if you have these spells, definitely if you have Flames from the Sky, and your opponent falls into the category of nations where any of their units or majors are human HP or lower, um, they have to take note of this and they have to adjust their tactics. They can't stack the same way. They can't do. They can't roll about the same way. They can't concentrate their labs the same way without domes. It affects the way they play, and in so doing, it lets you predict better what sort of threats they will bring at you. They are greatly confidence boosting, such that I would say this spell alone, Flames in the Sky, can make Evocation Nine a justifiable, maybe a second or a third level nine research path. For nations that have that level of fire access. For nations with this level of water access, which have cold three natural environments, I think Evocation 7 is a great buy. I think it's at its best for late age Atlantis, no surprises there, I love that nation, because they will be going Evocation anyway for things like Stygian rains, wailing winds, etc, wind of death, but there are other nations that can benefit as well. Um, because water is a particularly easy path to boost. Uh, relays can boost water to five um, under certain circumstances. Um, a whole bunch of nations can boost water to five relatively easily. And anyone who can boost water to three and has a nature cross path can get naiads to boost to water five. Like, murdering winter is not hard to access. And if you are willing to wolf and winter people, or if you're going to use it defensively, it's a great spell to have in your repertoire. Please don't use it against me, because it would be really, really annoying. Um, anyway, this video has gone longer than I expected, because I think remote uh, army killers deserve it. I'm probably going to roll together the province killers and province uh, remote attackers into a video, and whether or not I include remote assassinations in that one, or, or whether I separate that off, I'll decide once I start recording, but for now, I hope you enjoyed this. If there are any remote attack army killers that I have missed that you think deserve discussion, let me know. If I've missed anything in my analysis of these spells, let me know. And if you've encountered or have any tactics for either using or dealing with these spells, which I haven't discussed, I'd be very happy to hear from it. Most of my experience, to be very clear, is with these two spells. It's with the top end true army killers, um, and I think that their ability to force the enemy to change their tactics and also get inside the enemy's head. I think the re these remote attack spells force an enemy to always consider that you may cast them. And I think that's just tiring. I think that's mentally tiring. I think it's exhausting. I think it's stressful. I think it gives them a sense of dread every time they open their events menu. And that's a great disincentive for someone fighting you. And the fact that they are anonymous, just uh, I had never thought of using that before, but you could absolutely use this to influence the courses of wars that you're not even involved in um, in a really trollish way under certain circumstances. So anyway, that's that's remote attack army killers. I think that they're eh in their early stages, um, but these two at the top definitely have the potential to be game and meta shaping, and I wish you every luck using them against anyone other than me.